Hello friends, clients, and fellow financial advisors. My name is Ron Bullis and I'm the president and founder of LifeWorks Advisors, and this is another episode of The Future of Advice. My guest on today's show is widely considered to be one of the foremost leaders in the wealth management industry. He's the principal and founder of Advice Period, the former chairman of Convergent Wealth Advisors, a firm he helped found in 1994, and he's considered to be a pioneer for the independent advisory industry. He is also the founder and visionary behind the cutting edge technology platform, Vanilla, which is seeking to revolutionize how estate planning is done between clients and their advisors. He's widely known for his contemporary approach to wealth advisory, as well as his estate planning knowledge, and he's a frequent speaker on both topics. He memorialized his concerns about the conflicts of interest in our industry in his guide for consumers, Get Wise to Your Advisor. He's received many industry accolades, including being ranked number one by Barron's in both his state of California and number one in the national rankings in numerous time periods. In 2019, he was named WealthManagement.com's Thought Leader of the Year, and his firm has received numerous awards for its culture and industry pay setting. He's a champion for the fiduciary standard and for consumer education and financial services. In 1995, as part of the development of his previous firm, Convergent Wealth Advisors, he founded CMS Reporting. CMS Reporting is now known as Fortigent LLC, a leading provider of outsourced wealth management solutions with more than $75 billion in assets on the platform. Fortigent was acquired by LPL Holdings in 2012. He's been a member of YPO, the Young President's Organization, since 1998, and he's an accomplished pilot and enthusiastic lacrosse fan. Welcome to the future of advice, Steve Lockshin. Hey, Ron. Thanks for having me on board. Yeah, thank you for being here. I've been looking forward to this conversation now for quite some time. You're building a platform for advisors to essentially run their business anywhere, which I, I think is really, um, really interesting. So why don't we just start for the people listening, advisors and clients that maybe aren't familiar with who you are and advice period. Why don't you just give us a quick um, you know, background on why did you start advice period um, and a little bit about your firm? Uh, I started advice period. It was called a, a third iteration of the same business. Been doing this since 89 and really wanted a clean sheet of paper opportunity to do the things that I believed in and had little success. So I had the freedom to be able to kind of pick the clients that we want on board and uh, the folks that work with us and how we did things. So two other folks I worked with at uh, our old company that we had sold the city national bank came over and we started a business that was very focused on advice. Uh, really, and hence the name. Uh, first of all, it's very hard to come up with names where you can get the URL, the trademark, <laughs> et cetera. And I was sitting around one night, like, I just want something that explains that all we do is give advice, period. And that's where the name came from. Um, and so that's, that's really what the business is about. Um, very, very focused on advice and planning, charge differently. Um, I think we look at the world a little different than most of the folks in the industry. Yeah, and, and one of the things that your website says, and I wanted to ask you about it, is right on your homepage it says, you know, we're reinventing wealth management. The current model is totally outdated. Not just outdated, but like totally outdated. Um, so as somebody who, you know, I think, you know, from reading your bio and doing some research, you started, you know, in the independent advisory space, like you said, back in the late 80s and started another firm. Was it um, Convergent Wealth Advisors in 94? Um, what about the business model in your mind is the totally outdated part? The, the part that's outdated, I mean, I, I always explain it that when I started and my mentor, who's a real senior guy at Morgan Stanley now, um, you know, you'd walk in in the 70s, 80s, and an advisor broker would say, well, Ron, how old are you? He'd say, well, I'm 40. Great, you should be 40% in US bonds and 60% in blue chip US stocks and I'll pick them for you and I'll charge you commissions. And so that was the regime when I started. Then it moved to asset allocation, but the industry is still very focused on uh, moving towards planning. But for the most part across the industry, it's I can get you a better asset allocation. I can get you in the funds other people can't. Still very mm -hmm. focused on the investment piece. Um, and trying to create 
an illusion of complexity uh, when there doesn't need to be complexity and an illusion of you'll never be able to do this on your own. This is why you're going to pay me a lot of money. And we still, at least in the U.S., hide fees uh, across the industry. Yeah. When I look at it, uh, you know, when we started LifeWorks and, you know, haven't been in the industry as long as you, one of the things that was the common reoccurring theme we heard from both advisors and clients was we would just like to know what we're paying and what we're paying for. Are we paying for the asset management work and then getting some financial planning for free? Or are we really paying for planning, but you're just charging my ad? You know, there was a significant um, kind of like muddying of the waters, so to speak. Uh, and I, th I still think it's there, right? Oh, 100%. Well, and if you think about humans, human nature, people are going to focus on the areas and where they, which they get paid. So if you charge based on assets under management, What's your primary objective? We kind of inverted the model and said, we think the planning and particularly the clients that I typically work with where it's their, they have taxable estates. So very focused on estate planning. We charge a lot more for that um, where it's easy to add tangible demonstrable value and, and articulate the, what you're paying and what you're getting. We charge a lot less for the investment management and we try and keep that very, very simple. But Unlike most of the industry, we charge a flat fee. Here's my net worth. Here's the amount of investments that I have that need to be overseen, and it will kick out a fee, and they can play with it. So there's no fee negotiation. You know, you walk in, you know what you're paying. Yeah, I think this is um, interesting, and, and I'm going to maybe keep digging at this a second because when I talk to, you know, advisors that are at large firms or um, you know even even running their own RAAs, I've had someone tell me like, "Are you really sure you want your clients?" Uh, seeing their fee that clearly, like, and are you sure you want to put it, you know, so front and center? And I'm thinking to myself, like, well, if we don't, then they're just wondering what it is, which continues to drive this gap of trust between, you know, the advisor and the client. Um, where you're sitting, I think how you guys are approaching it is unique. Uh, are you seeing more firms in your area and even nationally in your networks that are starting to adopt the same approach, or would you guys still say you're at the front end of kind of shifting how? you know, the business model is, is set up between advisors and clients? I'd say we're, we're definitely at the front end, although it's been accelerating, but this is a lot like going back to the, you know, late nine, late eighties, early nineties. Back then people weren't doing asset allocation. They weren't diversifying globally. They, they weren't hiring outside managers. It took 20 to 30 years for that really to kind of permeate the industry. And I don't, the industry is even not fully there. Um, it's significantly there, but um, it's not fully there. So I think it's going to take 20 to 30 years for the industry to probably do the same thing around fees unless technology kind of forces it upon advisors. So if the notion of transparency and, and accessibility of that information becomes very, very easy, you know, digestible, then it will probably force the industry to move faster. But right now, nothing's pushing our industry. Yeah, I, I was just um, looking at the TDFA Insight study, right? At we custody with TD Ameritrade, and, and uh, 96 cents of every dollar of revenue was in assets under management, you know, fee. And and the average firm lists something. I I, I probably misquote the report a little bit. But the average firm says they do something like 15 different services for their clients, and only two or three of them are actually asset management services, which means four cents of every dollar of revenue is allocated to like the majority of the services they say they actually offer. Um, and, and I chuckle a little bit about it, but it, but it's crazy, right? It's, um, I mean, we, we tell our team and our clients that you measure what matters, which is stealing a little bit from the book, Measure What Matters by John Doerr. Um, you measure what matters and then, you know, the business should be monetizing what it's measuring, right? So to your point earlier, if you get paid by assets under management, are you actually focusing on doing good, sound planning, right? Or bringing some level of expertise, or are you just trying to, you know, fill the piggy bank up with assets? So I'll, I'll this reminds me of a couple of lines. Um, years ago, we did the reporting for Arthur Anderson. Now, some people might argue we single-handedly took Arthur Anderson down, but I think that's not true. Um, <laughs> but, but Arthur Anderson, when they did get into this business, my old company, we got connected with them and started doing it. And I won't say who said it because he ended up in our industry. But one of the guys said, look, let's just be honest with each other. 
our job is do the absolute minimum amount of work that you have to do for the client so you can continue to get paid. But that is what most of the industry, I think, believes. And so Mm -hmm. another anecdote around that is some my parents, because I kept them separate when I left Convergent, I couldn't take clients with me. And so they went to a broker at one of the major wirehouses, a number one Barron's guy in his state. Yeah. And and I'll tell you, it ended badly. We ended up suing them. Really? Um, They did a horrible job for the client. Wow. But what they said on their website, we do estate planning, we do financial planning, we do all that stuff. So when I finally looked at them, like, you haven't done any of this stuff. All they cared about was the assets under management. And I think that's the epidemic in the industry is if you're getting paid on assets under management, you're going to do the minimum you need to keep clients happy. The clients that have money at Goldman that I sit on top of where when they know I'm involved, they bring out the planning guy who's really good. But if I'm not, the planning guy never shows up. Yeah. So it gets back to the, what's the minimum you have to do in order to keep the client happy. And to take it even one step further, I'll tell clients when they come in, I I give them kind of the anti-sale because I really believe this. I'm like, if they don't have a huge estate, so uh, because in that case, we'll use tax enhanced indexing, but I'll use a Vanguard fund as an example. I say, investing is just like going and joining 24 hour fitness. If you go to the gym, you're disciplined, you eat healthy, you keep a log, you're going to get 95% of the game. You're going to do great. And you can pay a lot less and do a great job. Some people decide that they want a trainer and they're willing to pay multiples of their monthly fee because they're not disciplined or they want to try and get that last 5% or they want a different experience. I'm a trainer. If you want to pay for a trainer, just know what you're buying, but you don't need me Mm. to succeed in the investing. Yeah. You know, I would agree with that. I mean, we're trying to maybe emulate emulate like a a firm like yours in some regards. And, you know, we're a a new startup RIA. Um, Why do you think the industry hasn't shifted fast for this? I mean, I I got a couple of opinions. I mean, Ernst & Young did a study a couple of years back that said it was advisor compensation and technology that was probably mostly to blame and and lagging behind. I think there's maybe also a culture in our industry of rewarding like the best salespeople, right? Um, I came out of a large national insurance firm, great insurance company, Um, not saying anything bad about them. Uh, But the people who always got the recognition, the rewards are the people who are the best at selling product, right? And I feel like we're shifting into an era that the way we add value as advisors is truly to be a trainer, a coach, you know, provide guidance. And that requires specialty and intellectual property, whether it's the ability to coach or to guide or like a high degree of specialization around taxes. What do you think it is that's holding maybe the the thing that's probably most holding the industry back? Is it that there's too many advisors who are generalists who if you kind of strip it away and say, what can you actually do to add value? And it's maybe maybe nothing. Um, Or do you think it's, you know, firm culture or compensation or, or some combination of a few things like that? I, I think it's all of those. I mean, I'll, to, to put a label on it, it's it's greed. It's the structure. We are the most overpaid industry on the planet um, for the level of value that most advisors bring to most clients. I mean, the data says mm-hmm. most advisors detract value. They don't add value. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. clearly, as I like to say, if the hair on the back of your neck is standing up when I say this, you're probably one of those advisors. If <laughs> if not, then, and you're adding value, then part of it is just how we're compensated yeah. and what what we've driven the industry towards. The tech thing's easy yeah. to solve, but the industry doesn't want us to solve it because complexity yields the higher fees. Got it. Right, you go to a robo, how hard is that? Kind of picking up on this conversation, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I was telling you, I gave a presentation. Uh, that's actually how I met uh, Marty Bicknell, who introduced us. And I was giving a presentation to, you know, uh, through the Scratchrich program and trying to raise some some capital for the technology we're building. And I said to a bunch of, uh, you know, people running RIAs, uh, let's just go to your website a second and ask a simple question, like, how do I become a client? Right? And they were like, well... Um, I'm like, and then let's just go to, you know, Wealthfront or Betterment or, you know, pick a robo platform. And what surprised me, and, you know, I have a fairly young team. And so we all have accounts at places like that. And we've used a lot of those tools. And I said, how many of you in the room have ever opened an account with a robo 
advisor or used a, you know, a fintech platform. And like, no hands went up. And I said, look, I, I know we like to think that what we do is, is so amazing that there's no comparison, but there's a lot of things that we should be learning from that industry. I mean, the standardization of their onboarding, the speed with which they do it, the, you know, the way they can take all the fat off the bone, so to speak, in terms of fee structure, because they've automated the things that 90% of our industry is still paying a human to, to type data in here and then to type data in here and then to send a form out. I mean, it, it, it blows my mind still. Yeah, I, I, what you do is exactly what I do when I speak at conferences. I'll, I'll say, how many people in the room have a robo cat? It's always less than 5%. And then I say, how many of you have more than one robo account? And it's usually one person in the audience. And I would open one pretty much yeah. everywhere they, they you could just to see what was going on and to make sure that we were bringing mm -hmm. kind of new thinking to, to the business. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the things I read a couple years ago, that, that same Ernst & Young Global Wealth Management Report, you know, I mean, robo-advisor platforms have been around, what, since like the mid-2000s, something like that. I think maybe the first one came on. And industry studies are still showing that consumers who are looking for financial advice or guidance or education, they want it and they're willing to pay for it. And so I keep telling advisors, look, don't, don't think that if you automate sections of your business that you thought were your value proposition before that somehow clients won't still want you. Like, I think that's a, a false dichotomy that's painted that, well, if I actually show them that, you know what, I actually don't manage their money anymore. I just picked an asset allocation and some TAMP or somebody in the home office somewhere is actually pushing the button or it's a computer doing the buy-sell trades. I don't think the average advisor wants to let their clients know that they're not actually managing their money or moving stuff around when the market moves, right? Um, so for an advisor that's maybe listening, that's thinking, okay, I, I get that I should be moving towards planning. Um, I should be thinking about that. Are you sure clients want to pay for it? And it's not just the high-end market that Steve's maybe, you know, has background in, you know, out in California. Does a planning first approach work with the, you know, uh, a, a smaller client base or a next gen, like a younger client? What are your thoughts on that? Um, so we have no minimum. Um, if you look across roughly a thousand clients, there are a hundred that are kind of in the ultra affluent space that, that are, you know, the clients I work with for the most part. And so some of the other advisors have some ultra affluent, but the majority of them are from zero to $5 million. Um, and so mm -hmm. it's the exact same offering, same premise. It's, it's like technology in our space. It's the clients aren't the problem. The advisors are the problem. The story doesn't originate with the client. The story originates with the advisor. And I see it in my own shop. When we started, I wanted 100% online, no paper reports. Mm -hmm. Even my partner's like, ah, my older clients want PDFs they, or they want paper. I'm like, no, they don't. I've got yeah. everyone's parent has an iPad, has an iPhone. Yeah. Um, you know, my dad's 80. He doesn't want anything he can't do on his iPhone or his iPad. So it was the advisor, it wasn't the client. It's, it's no different when it comes to um, the experience, when it comes to the relationship. It's the advisor that makes up the story and pushes it on the client as opposed to even asking clients what they really want. The market's the market. It goes up, it goes down. Long-term, we believe it goes up. Mm -hmm. here's, here's what your planning suggests you should do. Let's focus on the things that we can control. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of buzz in the industry, maybe for the last couple of years that I've been paying attention to it anyway, about client experience, right? I think every conference I've been to in the industry, somebody's talking about client experience. Talk to us about how you think about creating a client experience that is both relevant and valuable today and that has the ability to evolve or, and, and kind of win the future of where uh, you know, our industry is going. How do you think about framing the client experience in a way that's going to win? So, so I believe clients hire advisors because they want to transition the responsibility of dealing with their wealth to somebody else. So the first thing is make sure that they know that you've got a handle on everything. And so, so many advisors don't have a handle on everything. They only have a handle on that which they care about, which is the asset management. But have they really looked at the insurance? Have they looked at the estate planning? Have they looked at um, stuff for their kids? Do they make sure that their kids who are 18 have HIPAA releases in case they get in an accident while they're at college and things of that nature? You know, it, If they're not paid to do it, a lot of them just don't do it. The other thing is 
uh, David Canner at, at Fidelity coined a phrase that I use all the time, which is, at least I think he coined it, but he said it to me, um, our clients want a little, a lot. So we got away from the quarterly meeting. It's like, call us as you need us. There's certain things, there's a cadence of mm -hmm. things we'll go through with you, but we're not going to do this quarterly meeting anymore. We're going to talk to you sometimes every day while we're in the middle of something. Sometimes we won't talk to you for months. Our job is to just be proactive about it. And again, solve the problem where they've handed off the responsibility to us. And then we have taken that responsibility and treated it with the respect that it deserves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we live in a world that is instantaneous, right? Um, I mean, clients are used to texting their kids and, you know, I'm 39 with four kids at home, one of whom's a teenager in high school. And uh, I, well, even my four-year-old daughter knows how to uh, <laughs> send a text message to me from mommy's iPhone. So, I mean, we live in this world where it seems like the entire industry or the entire, you know, the, the in client base and consumer base is just used to instantaneous communication back and forth, text messages, chats, solve a problem, subscribe to something, move on. And I feel like our industry is still kind of stuck in this, what I call the Moses method, right? Let me go, let me get some information from you. Let me go back to my office, walk up the mountain, talk to God, put down some Ten Commandments, come back and go like, you know, here's what you should do. And by then it's like, it's already, it's irrelevant. It's, it's, it's moved on, you know. Um, but I still, you know, there's still firms out there that won't let their advisors text. And I understand regulatory compliance and, you know, things like this. But um, when you're limited in the speed with which you can engage with a client, some of the things they want to just have an answer for are today, not three days from now when you get your PDFs printed. <laughs> you, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head and clients are used to looking at stuff online. Everything we have is online 24 seven. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't want paper other than when the custodians force us to have paper, which hopefully <laughs> will go away. Um, there should be complete transparency. It should be mm -hmm. digestible. We don't have to make it complex. The clients who want, in fact, best, best example, when we started Betterment Institutional and, and Marty Bicknell and I, you know, started really marketing that. And when they first started doing it, um, advisors were worried that the clients would fire them and just go to Betterment. It is completely made up. The people who decide to hire an advisor are the same people in the gym that decided to hire a trainer. They've already opted yeah. in. So now just do a yeah. great job. Don't keep forcing them to opt in. Yeah, and the people that are going to do it on their own and want to do it for free, if they were at Betterment, they're now at Robinhood or some other free trading app or something, right? Yeah, they've, they've moved on in search of whatever price point they want. Yeah. So um, shifting gears just a little bit, I'd, I'd love to get your insights on what you think are maybe the top two or three most significant challenges that advisors and firms face today in terms of you know winning clients, servicing clients, their business model, just maybe anything in that realm. What do you think the top two or three, or maybe if we've got a handful of things that are the biggest challenges advisors and firms are facing? Well, since I like to uh, usually poke the bear a little bit, I'd say homogeneity, um, arrogance, <laughs> um, greed. So I go out of my way to be different and ego this I deserve to get paid more. I want to get paid. It's all about how do I get assets under management mm -hmm. until the advisors change and the industry helps change. That's not going to stop. Um, case in point, Charles Goldman, who used to run Schwab Institutional and Fidelity Institutional um, and Asset Mark, um, he and I tried to start something um, that was a good housekeeping seal of approval for advisors. When it came time to really opt in, particularly with the custodians, they all opted out. And when you have, instead of trying to raise the bar and have advisors do a better and better job and therefore bring in more revenue from the folks that aren't doing a good job, they were like, yeah, it ain't broke. Consumers can't tell the difference. Yeah, you know, it's an it's, uh, interesting thing. I had a mentor years ago before I started LifeWorks that gave me a copy of a book that's been around forever. It's called Differentiate or Die by Jack Trout. Um, and I've probably read it now a dozen times because I find the challenge of it to be really interesting. And essentially it was this, it was like, if you line a hundred people in your industry up and you know they have 30 seconds to say what makes them different and why you should hire them. In our industry, I think you'd hear 99 of the same answers if you had a hundred advisors or firms standing there. They'd say like, we care for you, we're here for you, we're gonna make sure you're okay, we take care of everything. Yada, 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 down the line. And so the question is like, you know, 
when we were setting up LifeWorks, you know, we said we don't want to differentiate on price, right? Because the, the race to zero also then basically says, well, the intellectual property we have or our ability to help people make wise decisions, you know, gets commoditized then, and, and that's what consumers want. Um, so we do this exercise regularly, right? Where we say, like, what is it that we're actually doing that's valuable and different? And then how do we maximize that and focus on it? Um, and I don't know if it's the industry needs to have this ego and greed piece still, and I'm kind of poking at large firms as well. I have a little bit of a more of a hate than love relationship with most of them. Um, because they seem to, whether it's in terms of capturing advisors and keeping them in their, you know, their pen, so to speak, right? Well, you're never going to be able to do this young advisor who wants to start your own firm or maybe, you know, successful advisor in the industry because we're, you know, pick, you know, the moniker, you know, the big firm on Wall Street or the big financial services firm. Like, you need us. And I think to myself, like, um, anybody with an iPhone actually could probably get an, their own RIA started these days, like, from their iPhone, <laughs> right? Um, and I would dare say if you were to ask a bunch of consumers if they knew who their custodian was or if they could tell you the actual name of the firm their advisor works for, they might actually be hard-pressed to do that. People start to tell themselves, well, if everybody, if nobody else is doing this, then it's not what needs to be done. So I was talking to a business manager the other day. We were going through a very wealthy client of theirs. And, and I said, you know, none of the other folks, they were getting a new proposal, firing their old manager, mm -hmm. advisor. They said, well, nobody asked for the estate planning stuff like you do. And I know you show me the numbers and how much impact it has, but why doesn't anybody else ask for it? And I was watching a documentary the other day um, about cults. And they said, like, how do people join cults? And there was something I'd never heard of called the Ash Conformity Test, which was done, I think, in the 50s or 60s. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yeah, I, have, I am. Yep. And they would ask, you know, they have six people lined up where they'd show them lines. And five of them were actors and one was the subject. And, and they'd all go through and say, which one looks closest in length to that one? They'd all say the right ones for a couple. Then they would start saying the wrong ones. And when all five would say the wrong ones, the real subject would then agree. They conform. Just because everyone else is doing something doesn't make it right. And that's one of the big problems in our industry is because there is homogeny, because everyone is kind of doing the same thing, that's what consumers have come to expect. And I think it's an opportunity for the better advisors to differentiate. Um, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think there's a, a very negative trickle down effect as a result of all this that, that I'd love to see change. Yeah. Well, I, you know, when we were setting up LifeWorks, I remember one of the things we were talking about with one of the compliance attorneys was, you know, we got a little bit of a I won't say a lecture, but you know we're not certain that um, you know a monthly subscription model is going to be seen by the regulators as being in the client's best interest. I, I remember having this conversation. I was like, how, how, like they can cancel at any time. They select the service level. It's a transparent fee, and they're like, well, you're going to have to make sure you're delivering something to them, you know, every month. So, and I'm like. What? I remember, but it was three years ago, I think we had this conversation, but I remember it like it was yesterday because I'm sitting there going, from the regulators to the largest players in the industry to the average financial advisor, the entire industry is still thinking in an old paradigm, right? They're still thinking that, well, you know, if it's an asset or management fee, then when their assets go up, you make more. And I think, yeah, you make more, but you, you don't have to do any more work, <laughs> right? It's like... You got a pay raise, market goes up 30%. You've got a 30% increase in revenue to your firm, let's say, if you're all asset management fees. Um, but did you actually produce 30% more value? Well, and the opposite, if you take a 2009, you know, post 08, you were, most advisors were earning 20% less if they had variable mm -hmm. fees, but they were working much harder. It's, it actually creates the wrong environment because at that point, maybe you're laying off people you actually need to work the most. It also it also motivates um, taking unnecessary risk. I mean, if you think about it, if you're competing, yeah. you've got half a portfolio, someone else has to have the portfolio, and you want to get the assets under manager. There's just a lot of factors, I think, that weigh into our current model that just don't get considered. And I think the regulators, like you said, they're, they're living in the Stone Age. It's the fact that we couldn't get well, the fact that the fiduciary standard is a joke. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, uh, so before we talk about the fiduciary standard, you'll find this uh, maybe a little chuckle. So my, 
my business coach, who's well known in the industry, fabulous guy, brilliant, has helped us in a lot of ways setting, uh, setting our company up. Um, a year and a half ago, uh, he made a bet, and hopefully he's, he'll watch this episode and remember it, uh, in our study group where he said, you know, Ron, I, I bet you that when we have the next market downturn or some kind of you know, economic issue or recession, you're going to see the people paying you a monthly subscription fee for planning like just absolutely start falling off. Right? You'll be the first thing people cancel because they'll be paying their other bills. And I was like, I'll take that bet. I think you're absolutely wrong. I think we'll grow during it. And um, you know, not bragging or anything, but our, our firm stopped taking on new clients when COVID hit last year and we focused on the ones we had. And, and people were absolutely grateful for the fact that we were there. We worked harder than ever. I mean, your, your point was absolutely right. I mean, we were putting in monstrous uh, weeks with helping our clients file for PPP loans and figuring all this stuff out. Um, but we did the right thing for them. And our revenue didn't shrink. In fact, we actually grew. And then we started having our clients say, hey, when you're ready to start taking back on clients, like a, a bunch of my friends, um, like I've been telling about you guys, and now it's like, they're like, yeah, we gotta do this. So I actually, he owes me, I think it was a steak dinner we bet over that one. So um, fiduciary standard, uh, this, one, this one drives me nuts. Let's maybe just poke the bear a little bit here. Um, I call myself a financial advisor. Somebody at uh, a large warehouse calls themselves a wealth management advisor. Somebody another RAA calls themselves something else, financial planner. Somebody at a national insurance company calls themselves a financial planner. And there's absolutely no uniform standard, in my opinion. I might be slightly wrong on this, but when I look at this, I think I couldn't call myself a doctor if I wasn't adhering to the Hippocratic Oath and I didn't actually go to med school and I wasn't actually practicing medicine, right? I mean, they go to jail for doing that. And we can have you know, somebody like yourself who's taken on the risk and the burden and the compliance uh, liability of running an RAA and truly operating as a fiduciary. And then you maybe have somebody sitting inside of a large firm, whether they're well-intentioned or not is not the issue, but they're getting to use the same title, the same nomenclature, right? But they have product sales requirements and managers and distribution chains and you know cross-selling of, of banking services and credit card, you know. Riff on that one for me a little bit, because my guess is you probably also have some more insights and feelings on, on this that people listening will find interesting. So when Advisant, which is the thing that Charles Goldman and I try to do, fell apart, I started writing this white paper about exactly this topic about the industry and mm -hmm. fiduciary. And that morphed into this, the book, Get Wise to Your Advisor, which I went back and read through the other day, which I wrote in 2012. And sadly, everything, nothing has really changed. We're handling one of the most important facets of someone's lives, right? Your health and your wealth and your family. You, you know, family people deal with whether it's their community or their church or temple or whatever. Um, health, you've got your doctors, as you said. Um, and, and even your priest or your rabbi or whatever goes through some training and schooling. We, we don't do anything. We just read yeah. some books and, and take some sales chatter. In fact, there's not even recurring education that's required to be a broker, maybe to be a broker, yeah. but it's mostly compliance. Yeah, there isn't. Uh, yeah, in fact, when we gave up our series sevens and you know the things that we were told we had to have and you know I'm pretty good at taking tests, so I, I chuckle about this. I, I read a book, I take a test, I pass it. Um, I knew nothing about being a financial advisor, but I was like, okay, now I have my Series 7 and 66, and away we go. Um, but then when I left, uh, again, the, the large firm and we started an RAA and went f truly fee-only, um, I was like, man, how much, how much CE do you think we're gonna have to do? And I remember you know, finding out, like, wait, I don't, even, I don't even have continuing education requirements? Like, wow. Like, my CPA does, my attorneys do, let's hope the doctors do, you know, like I am now fully liable for all those things. And wow, interesting. It's, it's um, I'm a pilot, Ron Carson's a pilot, you know, a bunch of folks in the industry are pilots, you know, probably something our personality enjoys doing that as well. But if you think about it, we have to annually do the insurance companies are flying complex things. So think of your handling complex clients. We have to go to school every year for this. You have to pass tests. You have to go to the doctor, at least at my age, every year to get a medical. I mean, they're making sure that you're not killing yourself and other people when you're flying an airplane. 
Those are the standards. And, you know, the FAA certainly is not the most efficient organization in the world, but the theory around it makes sense. It's no different than doctors, lawyers. We don't have to do any of this stuff in the industry. And so if you think about it, there are so many people doing a poor job because they make it complex and the clients are like, yeah, I like, you know what? I like Jimmy's personality and he takes me to play golf and he's got these really cool uh, products that guarantee me I'll always get my money back. um, (laughs) And I only get, you know, I can get up to 15% of the S and P I mean, only in certain years, but I think there's fees in there, but I I don't really understand it. It's a lot of paperwork. Yeah. He's a good guy. He's like, he went to college with my buddy. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, we as humans inherently want to trust people that other people we trust, trust, right? There's something about that kind of like you're either guilt by association or you're trusted by association. I think from the studies I've read, that still seems to be like the number one way people select advisors and services is some type of, you know, referral from a family member or friend or something like this. Um, I mean, we'll, we probably don't have time today to get into the uh, the whole product side of it because you're referencing one of the what I think is the bane of the uh, of the financial industry, which are these, you know, equity index annuity products and things like this. And, and the fact that somebody can sell one of those while discussing retirement and truly what I believe providing financial advice, but then not even have to have the, the, the financial advisory license that we have and no liability for it. It's considered a product sale. I mean, they can sell them a, you know, a lemon of a car, so to speak. And, you know, well, you know, they had 30 days or whatever to, you know, have a free look. And after that, it's like buyer beware. And it's like, we audit some of these things because clients show up with them. And I'm like, it's going to take us a couple of weeks to try and even peel this whole contract apart and figure it out. It's probably, you know, it's probably a piece of crap on a popsicle stick, but we'll have to do the due diligence and go look at it. And it might, you know, and I think to myself, like the average person hears, you're not going to lose your money, right? You get to participate in the upside and then the product is sold, person moves on, and we maybe run into it a few years later and the client's going like, this didn't, like, this actually didn't work out the way, <laughs> the way we thought, right? That was one of the, the, the main points is we operate off of the primal greed and fear. Mm-hmm. And so if the market's doing well, the product that's being sold is one that allows you to participate. And if the market's not doing well, it's one that protects. And the advisor will change their theme based on. You mean on, to tell me, Steve, there's no such thing as a free lunch? I mean, come on. <laughs> I even ha- even internally, we had our investment committee meeting yesterday, and they were talking about some of the advisors feel the need to have alternatives for fixed income because of the interest rate environment, mm-hmm. or they want alternative assets. Now, my clients, for the most part, have no hedge funds unless they showed up in there. Mm-hmm. I, I don't have a lot of complexity in the portfolios because I don't feel that it adds enough value for the taxes, the fees, the illiquidity, et cetera. And that regular capitalism works just fine. And let's focus on the things like fees and taxes and estate planning. Um, and so I asked the, the head of our IC and I said, so of the advisors that believe that they need to have alternatives or alternative fixed income in the portfolio, they're arguing that their clients need these. So it would follow then that it should be sporadic and spread out across all advisors that various clients would need them. Of course, the data is not, does not say that. Data says advisor A believes in these and therefore all of advisor A's clients have that. And advisor B's clients yeah. doesn't believe in that and none of their clients have it. And as a result, we're back to, it's the advisor pushing their belief system, whether it's technology, whether it's investments onto the client and not doing our job as a fiduciary, which is hear what matters to the client and then help them achieve their goals in the most efficient way. Yeah, so I gotta ask you something about this. This, is, this will be me poking, poking back at the bear in the industry. Our firm stopped doing risk tolerance questionnaires with our clients two years ago. Um, again, our pedigree, you know, my, myself and the founder, we, we came out of a large firm. And so that was, you know, first thing you did was an RTQ and 10, 15 questions, whatever, score it. And then when we left that firm, we're like, okay, we can use like, uh, you know, an electronic tool for this. We can use an online scoring type of system. And now there's, there's lots of them out there. And we stepped back one day and I was just thinking about it. And I said, this is, this is wrong. Like, imagine if I went to a doctor cause I wasn't feeling well. And the doctor said, I'm going to run some tests, right? Doctor walks back in the room and says, hey, Ron, I've got bad news. You have cancer. 
be like, oh, that's terrible. But at least I know maybe what's wrong with me. Imagine if the doctor like turned his script pad around and was like, how much chemotherapy and radiation would do you feel like having, right? I'd be like, uh, the least amount possible to cure me of the disease. Like nobody wants to sign up for like, give me the maximum, right? But when we follow this tried and true or what the industry's used, right? Client shows up because they're, they have a symptom. They're, they're unsure about their future. They're unsure about their investments. They don't have a plan. And the first thing the industry does is make them tell us how they feel about risk, right? And then we build an investment portfolio off that. I mean, it, that'd be like you and I going to the doctor and the doctor's handing us the script pad. I mean, it's, it, it seems like a nonsensical way and a very reductive way of taking individual uniqueness and, and our true fiduciary duty and just completely squashing it and giving everybody the same thing. Yeah, the only place I'll push back on that, um, and I, by the way, we don't use risk questionnaires. Um, I, I happen to, I'm friendly with Aaron Klein. I like what they've done at Risk Alize mm -hmm. because it helps a lot of advisors that don't have the tool set. But I believe it's it's much simpler than that for the people who can do this. And it's, I go to a client and say, it's math first, emotion second. So Ron, you tell me what you have what's coming in and what's going out and what you want to live off of. And I'll tell you the minimum return, which will define the risk that is necessary in order to meet your objective. Then we look at just historical markets. I, I literally pull out three Vanguard funds. There's a, a 40, 40, 60, a 60, 40, and 80, 20 lifestyle funds that Vanguard has. And I show them all the rough periods and I go, here's the trade-off. And that helps measure like, no, I would panic. If I had a million dollars and it mm -hmm. went down to 600,000, I'd panic, okay? Mm -hmm. People have this misguided understanding of, of risk. It isn't just volatility. So a, a well-known NFL quarterback I met one day and he was telling me about his portfolio and he said, I got a super conservative portfolio. It's 80% munis, 20% blue chip stocks. You know, just and my guy at Newberger Berman manages it and they're, they're doing great. I'm like, what do you spend a year? So he tells me, and I said, so you're spending about 4%. I said, you have an unbelievably risky portfolio. In fact, you are guaranteed to fail. You will run out of money if you keep spending at this rate. A portfolio that had more equities in it would be a more volatile, but a much safer portfolio. You're just looking at the wrong thing. And that's the challenge with the risk questionnaires is it yes. ignores the math around yeah. what do I need in order to meet my goals or do I need to change my goals? Yeah, and I would agree with you there. I think the, the risk that gets seen is either the volatility and the potential swings up and down, but not enough conversation around the risk of the portfolio failing to achieve the goals that you need in order to live life you want, right? Um, and I feel like that's what clients in some regards when they're talking to us, I mean, they might have ran a calculator online or they might have even done some of their own math, but I think in some regards, they're looking for some help understanding like, what is this minimum rate of return that I need to earn to achieve this? And what is the risk of spending too much? That's one of the variables we can control, right? Spending and taxes, we tell our clients the same thing. Like we, we can't control what the market does. We, we have to take what it gives us like everybody else, but we can control our spending. We can control our trading. We can control like other facets um, that drive outcomes, right? So someone asked me to look at an IP, the same business manager I was mentioning earlier said, Hey, we got an IPS. Yeah. Can we take a look at it? And I read, I'm like, this thing's garbage. It's <laughs> totally protecting the advisor. Let me send you ours. And I yeah. go and I read through ours and it reads just like the one I said was garbage. And so I'm like, this makes no sense. This isn't really what the client needs. What the client needs to know is what is my minimum risk portfolio? What's the required return? then what's my desired return? And to the extent that my desired return is greater than my required return, then I recognize that I'm taking on additional volatility risk. And then giving them a super simple thing to measure against, whether it's Acqui plus Ag, or again, one of those Vanguard funds. So again, back to, we have a problem where we make things overly complex. Yeah, I really like the way you frame that because you're starting with the requirement and then you're, you're moving to the desired outcome, and then you're looking at the risks on both sides, right? The, the risk of the volatility causing them to make a bad decision, or the risk of maybe them being uh, over conservative with their investments and not being able to achieve their, the life they want, the outcomes they want. 
so talk to me a little bit about why estate planning. Um, I've been on the JustVanilla.com website. Um, our team's eagerly waiting to actually use it. I told them to hang on signing up until we had done this podcast and I want to talk about it. But um, you're poking at another industry that's uh, you know run by attorneys. Um, I'm not going to say maybe as regulated as ours, but it, it seems to be one that either clients ignore or advisors ignore, or maybe the clients are ignoring it because the advisors ignore it, but you kind of picked a boring one to build some really cool technology around. Tell me why estate planning and, and why not you know, maybe another area of wealth management that you felt like was outdated and needed to be innovated? Uh, one, like all necessity is the mother of invention. So um, after we started advice period and we were so focused on adding value through planning, it was very tough. If I took $100 million estate and I moved $20 million out of the estate and the client looked at the report the day before it had $100 million, the day after it had $100 million. Like, I don't, what did you do? I'm like, oh, well, sorry, you can't <laughs> see the $8 million of taxes that you're not going to pay now um, mm. and the other benefits. So we created a balance sheet that showed things the way we thought would be helpful to illustrate this that had what's your asset mix, not by large cap value, small cap growth, but how much is in personal real estate versus investment real estate or vested options versus diversified equity. Um, what's liquid versus illiquid, what's in my state, out of my state, and at age 95, assuming 5% growth, what that meant for me. Very quickly, people focused on, wow, why am I doing anything other than estate planning? Because that's not only a 40% return, it's a 40% instant return with compounding on top of that from all the yeah. growth that's out of there. So now I could go from Hey, hey, look, remember I told you I can get you a better asset allocation and get you some better investments. And if I do a really, 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 really good job, maybe I'll add 100 basis points a year over a 20 year period. Or I could add 40% right now with no additional volatility and it's guaranteed. Um, so we, that's what we focused on. So vanilla came from wow. that. And then we quickly realized advisors had no clue if they're if their clients were doing estate planning, the really good advisors were collecting the documents, but didn't know what they said. So didn't know if they were good or not. 80% of the time we're replacing the lawyers because the lawyers don't really do a good job. And by the way, there's no penalty for them being inefficient, slow, they bill by the hour, or nobody's checking if they do a good job or not. So now we're yeah. making that something easy. So now we're making the advisor again, a, useful fiduciary to help the client make mm -hmm. sure they've taken care of something, but they don't have to become an expert in it. And it's also the last frontier. There's plenty of financial planning tools. There's plenty of insurance stuff. There's, there's nothing helping advisors with estate planning. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, that's, that's true. We run into that now. In fact, our biggest challenge as we've sort of taken on clients, you know, nationally is we're getting the estate planning documents. We're talking to them and they're like, hey, we need this done. And we're like, okay, somebody's gonna get on the phone and start calling law firms in you know, XYZ city and interviewing them for our clients. And it's like, this is a this is a terrible way to go. <laughs> so what we did was we went to the documents that we've been using that we use for our biggest clients, documents we developed with McDermott and our own porter. And we basically got them, we're adding state by states, so we're making them state specific. But now you can go in instead of paying eight or twelve thousand dollars out of these for fifteen hundred bucks, you get everything done. We know they're high quality documents. All the data is in the system, so there it lets the advisor and the client know, hey, there's been a lot a change in your state. Like New York changed their healthcare docs last year, and so we can now notify people you need to update this because of that. We can be proactive, whereas lawyers are generally reactive. It's that it's not the lawyer's fault, it's the industry's fault. Um, and so now documents can be done. And if as an advisor, you don't have the capabilities to read the docs, you just upload the docs. Our team reads them and gives you a very nice printout on here's where they're deficient. Here's what the map looks like. None of these ugly PowerPoint or Visio um, maps of an estate. <laughs> it's done in a very attractive way. So now the client knows Ron knows about my family. He knows who gets what. He knows my total net worth. He knows who I love and don't love, if you will. He knows what my beliefs are about money. You take a very intimate part of the relationship and you bring it to life. Yeah, no, that that's awesome. Um, what are some of the challenges you guys are facing in that? Is it just you know the state by state burden, or or how is that the rollout of this platform going for you guys? 
it's, we were about two years in, um, the document generator works amazing. So now it's just adding states. And part of that's just demand because it costs us a bunch of money to get the documents set up for each state. So we want to have five or 10 people. Like if you said we're in Michigan, I got 10 people in Michigan, I'd spin up Michigan like that. And now we have Michigan working for folks. Mm -hmm. um, count it done, by the way, we'll just, we'll count it down. I've got somebody taking a note back here. Yeah, we'll talk after. <laughs> the, the other thing is advisors are still afraid. Um, they're mm -hmm. afraid, even my own guys, I hope this person isn't listening to this. One of my top advisors, I read through, I said, do you, did you collect your, do a good job. Do you collect all your client information? He said, yeah. I said, do you understand it? He goes, no. I said, we'll upload it and we'll, we'll review. I'll show you how the review process works. So we send it back He goes, I don't understand how to explain this to the client. I'm like, you don't have to, they don't expect you to be the expert. All you've done is identify that they have a problem. Back to your doctor example. I mm -hmm. ran you through our body scan. It looks yeah. like you have high blood pressure and possible uh, chance of need, needing bypass surgery. I'm going to send you to the right doctor. Advisors yeah. are afraid to not know everything. So they avoid mm -hmm. that, which they don't know. So that's, that's the other challenge. But other than that, it's, it's going well. And I just wanted more and more features rolled out faster and faster. <laughs> Building software um, takes years off the back of our life is uh, what I always tell my CTO. I feel like the product never goes fast enough and I'm probably losing, you know, won't make it to my 90s. All right, I want to shift gears because I want to be cognizant of your time. Um, one of the things that I'm focusing on with this, this podcast series is talking about what the future of advice looks like, what, what's in store for the future of our industry. So jump us out five years, 10 years, 20 years, some, some timeline out into the future. What are some of the big things that you see coming down the pipe um, and that you believe will be changes to our industry and, and how financial advice is delivered in the future? By the way, the last chapter of the book is exactly that question. <laughs> so All right, I'm going to read the book. I'm going to read the book. <laughs> um, and it's really designed for, for Joe Bag of Donuts to be able to tell the white hats from the gray hats from the black hats in the industry. But mm. one of the, I put in three things, my predictions for the future, and we'll, so far they're coming true, but we'll see. But some of the things I think that'll change is really the separation of fiduciaries from non-fiduciaries. And it, it goes back to digestible, uh, accessible information. And it's there. The FeeXs of the world help you understand what products cost. Those things will be integrated. A client will be able to upload and link their portfolio through Plaid or whatever. And it'll quickly tell you, you're getting hosed or yeah. you're in a decent portfolio. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think tech is going to revolutionize our business slower than folks like you and I think they will because as Bill Gates said, the people in the know always think it happens too slowly and the people who are not in the know think it happens way too quickly. Um, but I think that'll make a big difference. I, I think, I hope at some point that will cause a tip towards fiduciary and making sure that the laws change around that. Um, and then I think there's gonna be a very big growth in back to tech in the areas that support people that want to do those kinds of things. Um, I also believe that automation is going to take over about 90% of what we do. Natural language uh, processing will do better for clients than most advisors. Um, you know, and sometimes the best advisors aren't the best communicators. So how do we turn great advisors into great communicators and how do we use tech around that? So I just think tech, tech will enable things. I hope, I believe, I wish fiduciary really comes into play and the tech helps accelerate that. Um, and then I think, I hope that advisors will focus on the things that truly add value, not the things that line their pockets. So many more questions and I'm running out of time. Uh, let's maybe let's maybe do this. Uh, I'd love to have you back on, and I, I appreciate it. But let's let's maybe um, let's maybe end episode one here. Let's say or part one of uh, Steve's advice for the industry. Now I'll, I'm going to read your book and a few other things, and, and then we'll have you back on because I want to pick up this conversation again. I'm, I'm certain that the advisors listening to this are going to find this to be very informative. If you could give advice to the younger version of you, right? And, and you've been in the industry for a long time. What specifically would you tell the, the young, next-gen, hungry advisor who's just getting into the, the, the industry, or maybe they've been in five, 10 years, and they're, they're maybe feeling this disconnect between, I got all this great technology that I can use as an individual, right? I can, you know, Mint and Chase Pay and Zelle and Marcus and all this stuff, and then I'm over here with 
my firm's technology. What, what advice would you give to the young next gen growth oriented advisor um, if you were kind of maybe also speaking to your, your younger self? So since I like to tell stories, a few years ago, a friend of mine in the industry asked if I could meet with a young lady who um, was, had interned at Goldman, was going to, to Goldman. And, and I, I like to pick on Goldman mainly because they, they, they have a history of doing very well for Goldman. Yeah. The blood-sucking vampire squid, squid I think, is what Matt Taibbi uh, co coined the phrase. Yeah. <laughs> And, and no doubt, like anywhere, there's some very, very good and very smart and very honorable mm -hmm. people there. Um, but I said to her, she was trying to decide whether to go there or not. And um, you got to decide what's more important to you. Do you care more about making money or helping people? Hmm. If you're going to get the most energy and the most emotional satisfaction, the happiness, right? Because we all see the data. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Once you get past subsistence, having more money doesn't make you any happier. Now, everybody looks up and says, well, yeah, but if I get to here, I'll be happier. And if I get there, I'll be happier. <laughs> but once you get over a certain level, it isn't about making the money. It's about yeah. fulfillment. Um, and so making that decision and then following that path is, is what's important. What I didn't do when I started was I took every client on because I wanted to get, I need the revenue. I was bootstrapping my business. And so sometimes I took on clients that I, I shouldn't have and didn't want to take on that didn't align with my belief system. And then there were times when I started the insurance business like you did, where if you're, I'm, I'm a hammer, so everything's a nail. Insurance fixes that. Insurance fixes that. Insurance fixes that. <laughs> so part of it is just, Following, following your heart and your belief system. And, and it's hard to do when there's a lot of pressure around you, um, particularly around making money. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. I, I am excited about the opportunities for young advisors or, or maybe not even necessarily young by age, but just people coming into the industry now. Uh, it feels like there is a, you know, an ever growing number of RAAs out there. Again, a cottage industry with like really unique niche markets and I know there's some sameness stuff, but it feels like the choice isn't like big insurance company, big warehouse, or maybe this obscure RIA. It feels like there's more choices out there. So second part of the question then is, what advice would you give to people who are running and building firms or trying to build teams that are gonna win the future? What advice would you speak to around building the business that wins um, the future of advice? Uh, two quotes from a business school teacher. Um, one, she said, um, if you want to be great at something, you have to consciously decide to be bad at something. So if you want to be great at service, you have to be bad at pricing. You want to be great at pricing, you need to be bad at service. That's the trade-off, right? You want the no frills airline or the full service airline. Uh, you can't be both. Um, so, And the other was that culture eats strategy for lunch. And so you can have great strategy, but if you don't have the right people and everybody's rowing in the same direction, um, then it's going to be hard to execute on that strategy. And so I think it's, it's important. Um, and you see stagnant businesses out there. You see businesses that are being built only so they could be sold. Um, so again, it's deciding where do I want to belong and am I with the right folks? And there's, you're never going to hit it perfect. So don't look and keep looking unless you can find a place you think you want to be at for a while and then work together to build the business that you believe in. Yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's really, uh, really awesome advice, both for firms and for advisors. Steve, I have absolutely loved our conversation. I hope that um, we'll get to have you back on another uh, episode here in the future. We'll get uh, the book. The name of the book, again, um, for the people listening was, I'm going to go back up here, Get Wise to Your Advisor. Um, can we get it on Amazon, online, places like that still? Awesome. Um, go check out that. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Advice Period, uh, you can find it at adviceperiod.com. And I would encourage any financial advisor that is listening to this or watching it, go to justvanilla.com, justvanilla.com, and see what Steven's team is doing to, I think, change forever how estate planning is going to be done and how that value is going to be created for uh, both advisors, firms, and for clients. Steve, thank you again for being here. Thanks for sharing your, your background, your insights on the future of advice, and uh, we look forward to having you again, on again soon. Thanks. I really enjoyed it.